The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular, but in June 2010, they will become even more so. 32 teams will set out in pursuit of a dream to become world champions. This is Destination South Africa. Coming up, South Africa expects. We assess the chances of the host nation and hear from their opponents in Group A, France, Mexico and Uruguay. And we're with Diego Maradona, a World Cup winner as a player and now aiming to lead Argentina to glory as a coach. What sort of resistance will the likes of Nigeria, Greece and South Korea pose in Group B? I May 2004, South Africa celebrates as the Rainbow Nation is confirmed as the host for the 2010 World Cup. This is the greatest day for South Africa. As we all know, it's the first World Cup in, um, in Africa. And it really, really means a lot to South Africans, really. Hopefully it will make, uh, reshape the country. And as a South African, I'm looking forward to it. South Africa! We're gonna win the World Cup! 32 teams will soon arrive and begin their pursuit for glory. On six occasions, the hosts have partied throughout as their team has gone on to lift the trophy. The home team is unfancied, but still under pressure. Joining South Africa in Group A are Mexico, South American opposition in the form of Uruguay, and France, champions in 1998 and finalists four years ago. And this is where the talking will stop and the action will begin. The stunning Soccer City Stadium in Johannesburg will stage South Africa's opening game against Mexico on Friday, June the 11th. Preparing to carry the weight of expectation on his shoulders is Bafana Bafana's captain, Aaron Mokowena. Vastly experienced with almost 100 caps, he's eagerly anticipating his chance to lead his nation out and get the World Cup underway. I can't wait. I can't wait. I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a dream come true. Uh, one of the goals that I set for myself, being part of that, that team, opening the, the, you know, the Soccer City, will be really, really an, an achievement for me. And I'm looking forward to it. I mean, uh, I'm looking, for that, looking forward to that, uh, that pleasure. Calling the shots for the hosts is Carlos Alberto Pereira, who masterminded Brazil's win in 1994 and South Africa will become the fifth nation he's led at a World Cup. My history in football goes back 40 years. This is my eighth World Cup now, and I just couldn't stay away. Anyone who likes football couldn't. It's the peak of a manager's career, the peak of a player's career, and the most important tournament where everyone stops to watch. So I feel very motivated right now to work. I'm growing with my team and with my players, and it's that motivation that makes me be here. Carlos has been there, and he done it. You know, uh, great experience he has. You know, he knows how much it takes to go out there and win games in the World Cup in a serious pressure. He's been in seven World Cups. This is going to be his eighth World Cup. So his experience is going to play a massive role in the team. This is Pereira's second spell in charge of South Africa, and he's made significant changes. Striker Benny McCarthy has returned to the national team from his self-imposed exile. For me, it's like a blessing in the sky that, I, that I'm still playing football this day and that I'm, that I'm at that stage where I can, I can get to play my last World Cup probably in my, own, in my own country. So it's like really good and I'm really looking forward to it. And I just hope, honestly, I hope that nothing comes in my way or nothing stops me from, from, from achieving that, um, that goal. This will be South Africa's third appearance at a World Cup Finals. Having never gone beyond the group stage, much will depend on the form of their established internationals like Steven Pienaar, if they are to make it to the knockout stages of their own tournament. It's going to be a, a World Cup with an African vibe. 
uh, which is obviously a lot of singing, drums and, um, and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to be really, really a, a, a different World Cup altogether. And uh, exciting World Cup. Hopefully everyone who's going to be, be there will really enjoy the World Cup in South Africa. It's my eighth World Cup and I'm managing the host nation. It's a great challenge. Once you've experienced the World Cup, then it's an addiction. It's with you forever. If you're well prepared, then the atmosphere helps. And our fans are very passionate. I'm sure they'll help our side. South Africa opened the World Cup by meeting Mexico at Soccer City, before taking on Uruguay in Pretoria and France in Bloemfontein. France's road to South Africa was anything but straightforward. Qualifying began after a poor showing at Euro 2008, where they failed to make it beyond the opening stages, and the malaise continued. Under the guidance of Raymond Dominic, the French finished runners-up to Serbia in their qualifying group and found themselves in a playoff against the Republic of Ireland. The qualification was uh, not easy, but uh, I think uh, in the end of the not in the qualification we, we go through, and this is the most important, because now we need to focus about the future and not about the past. And I think we have uh, the, the squad strong enough for, for winning this World Cup. If you look like uh, every position in that team, I think they have some the best player in the world. World champions in 1998, European champions two years later, and World Cup finalists at Germany 2006. It seems some of the luster has gone from the star-studded French team. I think we have a stronger team than we did even in 98. Me, I knew what it was like in 98, but I know the current players too. And we've got a very strong team now. Now there's the possibility of having Benzema, Ribéry, Henri, Gorkouf, players who are used to that high standard of play, who play at the top clubs in Europe. But unfortunately, these players have difficulty expressing themselves for France, and that's a shame. Euro 2008 saw France finish bottom of their group, below Holland, Italy and Romania. The football world expected Raymond Domenech to lose his job, but controversially, he was retained. The European Championship of 2008 was a total disaster for the French team and the main responsibility lay with the coach. So the great problem of the French national team is the coach who, with the great players he has available, cannot build a team. That essentially is the problem for a French team that, after the European Championships of 2008, hasn't managed to rebuild. It wasn't a good campaign from the very first match when France lost by three goals to one in Austria, which was incredible, absolutely incredible. incredible. And after that, all the matches were a bit painful. Very tight. Even in the Faroe Islands, France could only manage with great difficulty a 1 0 win. It was complicated every step of the way. And we never saw the light. We just never saw the light. And on voit pas la lumière. On voit pas venir la lumière. We suffered in qualification. The fans were complaining. Every day they criticized the coach. And we didn't play well. Football is fragile. It's very hard to get to the top, but even harder to stay there. By finishing second to Serbia, it all came down to two playoff games against the Irish. The first in Croke Park, Dublin. Nicolas Anelka's goal with 18 minutes left gave France the advantage for the second leg in Paris 10 days later. It 
was a game mired in controversy. Thierry Henry handling the ball in the build-up to William Gallas' winning goal in extra time. The French were through on an evening which will be remembered for all the wrong reasons. Every year is like that. The qualification is very hard, but after we do a, a good tournament. But I told you, I think, yeah, a lot of people say maybe the French team is not good, but I, I will see when we play against the other team if they feel or not. First up for the French in Group A is a clash with Uruguay and Cape Town. Then they travel to Polokwane to play Mexico before meeting the hosts on June the 22nd in Bloemfontein. Mexico's route to South Africa was also testing. Defeat against the USA in the final CONCACAF qualifying round and coach Sven Joran Eriksson's job was on the line. Another defeat at the hands of Honduras and Eriksson was gone. Mexico lay fifth knowing only the top three were guaranteed to go to the World Cup. Enter former Atletico Madrid coach Javier Aguirre. It's just very, very difficult to prepare a team for such a big tournament when the players are playing every three days. It's not ideal, but it's the situation we're in. I use the experience of certain players to help me, guys like Cuauhtémoc Blanco, and then Gerardo Torado, Rafa Márquez also helped us, but more from the outside as he was only involved in the last match against El Salvador. And then there were people like Salcido, Osorio, people with World Cup experience such as Guillermo Franco. I may forget one or two names, but these were the guys who truly pushed us along. Despite losing his first game away to El Salvador, what followed was a transformation. Mexico won five consecutive games, the highlight being the defeat of the USA in Mexico City. Over 100,000 jubilant fans packed the Azteca Stadium to see Aguirre's men record their first win over their great rivals at home since 1937. A 4-1 win over El Salvador and Mexico were World Cup bound again with a game to spare. The men in green shot up from fifth to second place in the final 16 qualification group in the CONCACAF zone. After a draw against Trinidad and Tobago in their final game, L3 ended the group second behind the USA. We'll try and translate our form to the World Cup. We'll do our best, trust me. And the fans who come to South Africa to support us will be proud of their team. Because we'll see what happens results-wise on the pitch. But in terms of effort, work and fighting spirit, in that sense, my team, this Mexican team, are going to be in peak condition. After meeting the hosts in the opening game at Soccer City, Mexico travelled to Polokwane to take on France. Their final group game will be in Rustenburg against Uruguay. Uruguay, where football tradition runs deep. They hosted and won the first ever World Cup in 1930. This country, well, it's football mad. And it's difficult to express the qualities a Uruguayan player has and that deep-rooted pride he feels when wearing his country's shirt. Alcides Gigia scored the goal that beat Brazil in the 1950 World Cup. Distant days when Uruguay ruled the football world. Uruguay were by far the best country in the world, vastly superior to Argentina. Now there are fewer quality players than there used to be, fewer skillful and intelligent players. We used to play either 20 or 15 aside to improve our skills and experience. So what does that glorious past mean today? Is it a burden or an inspiration? Each country has its own history. Uruguay has already defined its own. As a player representing my country at the World Cup, I hope to write my own story with this team and become part of Uruguay's impressive history. With just four nations from ten in the South American qualifying zone guaranteed a place in South Africa, 
Uruguay could not have wished for a better start to their campaign. A stunning 5-0 win over Bolivia at home, with Diego Forlan leading the line. Obviously, after a match like that, we walked away with a lot of confidence and a real determination to carry on with the qualification process. Following that defeat of Bolivia, Uruguay's form became inconsistent. A series of disappointing draws and tight defeats were interspersed by memorable wins. But Uruguay found themselves entertaining Argentina in Montevideo, knowing they had to win to have a chance of automatic qualification. A victory for Argentina, and they were on their way to South Africa. Fuller puts it through for Suarez, and Argentina were almost behind there in the opening moments. Oh, so near! It was Lugano. We just didn't know how to play Argentina. We weren't attacking enough to win a match of that magnitude. Tackles flying in. Caceres is going in the book. Now that is surely going to incur the referee's displeasure. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. Yellow card, the second one shown. And Caceres is dismissed. Uruguay are down to ten men. Barron! And they, with that, have surely booked their place in the World Cup Finals. Well, that was a poor effort. It was Scotty, the defender, who had a clear scoring opportunity. The final whistle goes. Argentina beating Uruguay and taking a place in the finals in South Africa. I think that match in Argentina was incredible. Their coach was able to change a few things to keep the scoreline the same as he knew the result of Chile-Ecuador and that a draw would be enough to see them through. He took off a striker, replaced him with a midfielder and it paid off for him. That's football. So it was Argentina who took the final automatic qualification spot. But Uruguay had a lifeline, a playoff against Costa Rica. Winner takes all for a place at the World Cup Finals. A precious away goal in Costa Rica by Diego Lugano meant it was 1-0 going into the second leg in Montevideo. It was a very tough match where we pushed ourselves a lot. And thanks to Diego Lugano's goal, we were able to settle our nerves, win the match and move on to the following leg at home with a small advantage. Uruguay's first port of call in South Africa, where they'll meet France. A clash with the hosts five days later before they face Mexico. 
So all eyes will be on Soccer City in Johannesburg on Friday, June the 11th, when the World Cup gets underway and South Africa take on Mexico. The brand new venue will also host four other group games and of course the final on July the 11th. Guateng may be South Africa's smallest province, but it has the largest city, Johannesburg, and two World Cup 2010 stadia, Ellis Park and Soccer City. The city's rich history is being brought right up to date as it becomes the focus for the FIFA World Cup 2010. This is the 19th tournament, but the first to be held on the African continent. The city has led the way in preparing for this historic event, and now everything is in place. Soccer City has the honour of staging both the opening match and the final on July the 11th. Its new design was inspired by the calabash, a traditional African cooking pot. Mostly we have orange seats, but you'll see some grey uh, seats as well. And um, there's ten, uh, ten lines of grey seats, and these seats point towards nine. Nine of them point towards the host cities in South Africa. So there's one points to Durban, one points to Polokwane, one points to Nelspruit, and so on. And one also points to Berlin. And Berlin was where the last World Cup final was held. So that's that's the the architect thought that would be a nice uh, um, a story to be told in the stadium. Much of this. will be the second, uh, uh, the, the 12 guys cheering for South Africa and definitely going to beat Mexico. Of course my country, South Africa, I think we are going to win the World Cup from the first time. With the home advantage, maybe we can win. <laughs> Group B is an interesting mix of styles and brings together South America, Africa, Asia and Europe. Diego Maradona's Argentina win in Uruguay and they're through to the World Cup. Maradona was appointed Argentina coach in November 2008, with his country lying third in the South American qualifying group, having won just one of their previous seven World Cup qualifiers. It was amazing for us. We all knew what Diego had done. And for him to come and take charge of the national team made every one of us very proud. Maradona teamed up with Carlos Pilado, who was his manager when Argentina won the World Cup in 1986. Their arrival was all about bringing the passion back to Argentinian football. I'm going to try to take my country to the highest level it can get to. I always made playing for my country a priority. Playing for Argentina is the best thing that can happen to a player. You can score for Napoli, but to score for Argentina is something altogether different. Maradona's first competitive match in charge was against Venezuela. His appointment had gained the seal of approval from those inside the stadium. Once again, Lionel Messi got the home side off to a great start. Just after half-time, Messi provided Carlos Tevez with the kind of chance he doesn't miss. And it finished 4-0 to Argentina. The perfect start. So far, so good for Maradona. He had a 100% record after winning two friendlies and one qualifier. But at 3,600 metres above sea level in the Hernando Siles Stadium in La Paz, Bolivia shattered Maradona's honeymoon period with the national team. And this wasn't just a defeat. It was a 6-1 humiliation at the hands of one of the weakest teams in South American football. 
Back home, people began to doubt. Maradona may have brought glory as a player, but did he have the necessary experience to really deliver as a coach? Argentina had to bounce back, and they did, with a victory against Colombia. Daniel Diaz with the goal. But in Ecuador came another match at altitude and another setback. Walter Iovi with the first goal. The 2-0 defeat set up a crucial phase. First Brazil, who they met at home in Rosario. The match did not turn out quite as Maradona had imagined. A 3-1 victory for Brazil, their first World Cup qualifying win ever in Argentina. Disaster for Maradona. A wave of pessimism swept the country, and it looked as though Maradona's lack of experience in management was showing. Many thought he was losing control of the team. A few days later, in Asuncion, Paraguay dealt another blow to Maradona's hopes. Nelson Valdez scored the only goal to send Paraguay to South Africa. Argentina, meanwhile, according to the headlines, were not going anywhere. It was strange, because we saw that the people were suffering. It was an atmosphere that we weren't used to, because we usually qualify with two or three matches to spare. So that was a very strange feeling. The entire qualification campaign came down to the last two matches. Argentina needed four points from a home game against Peru and a tough-looking away fixture with Uruguay. We tried very hard to remove ourselves from everything that was said and written during the week of the match, because it put a lot more pressure on us. We were already under a lot of pressure because of the mathematical situation in the group and whether we would qualify for the World Cup. We tried to put it to the back of our minds, but that's difficult in a football-mad country like ours. We knew that we needed those three points and the victory. During the week, we'd heard so many things that Argentina would overrun Peru, that we'd thrash them, that Argentina would do this or that, and that's the kind of thing that drives a player crazy. Something strange happened in that match. We attacked for the whole of the first half, but we just couldn't score. For the second half, Martin Palermo came on as Maradona searched desperately for the breakthrough. But it was his other striker, Gonzalo Higuain, who delivered. And then in the second half, we got the goal. And we relaxed a little and started losing the ball. And then Peru got the ball and everything they didn't do in the first half, they did in the second. And they kept coming at us. And then there was the rain and the wind swirling around. We just couldn't play football. When they equalised, it was like that whole storm had been whipped up just for us, because it was around the final minute that they equalised. It looked like the end of the world for Argentina and Maradona, but there was yet another twist on that tempestuous night. In the 94th minute came Diego Maradona's saviour. The substitute, Martin Palermo, the big old-fashioned striker he'd brought on at half-time had scored the winner. Luckily, we never gave up, and we didn't let it bother us. And thank God, with the last kick of the match, Martin scored. That took a bit of the pressure off us, and then we could think clearly about the next game, which was going to be a real battle because of the circumstances in the group. And then came that all-important win in Uruguay. Argentina was South Africa bound. We have this pride in Argentina, which came through in qualifying, I think. Peru are 
all but had a point, and our hearts sank. But Martín managed to score with the final kick of the game. Then we went to Uruguay, where we all thought it would be a battle, where many people thought Uruguay would win. And we managed to get a victory that not many thought we could get. So I think Argentina have shown that if we're not playing well, or things are not going for us, then we can rely on our spirit, which is great. So if we're passionate, like Argentinians always have been, then I think things will be fine. So in the end, Argentina managed to get an automatic qualification place. Four points clear of Uruguay may look comfortable, but there were so many times when Argentina looked unlikely to make it to South Africa. There were some difficult moments, but now everything is a bit more relaxed. We can be calm, prepare well, and look forward to a great World Cup and put the bad times behind us. I've got a great group of players, and in Messi, I have the best player in the world. And I have players with hunger, I have players who have already played in World Cups and who know what it takes to concentrate completely on the World Cup. And that gives me an advantage over other coaches. And I say that we're going to win the World Cup. Argentina's first game in South Africa will be at Ellis Park in Johannesburg against Nigeria before Maradona's men play South Korea and Greece. It's the first World Cup in Africa, and one team sure to make it more colourful are Nigeria. The Super Eagles are playing in their fourth World Cup finals, and their fans are ready for a typically eventful campaign. We're going to be excited because so many Africans are going to be there watching it and uh, cheering the African team and uh, giving them the support. and. Uh, it's going to be fun and a great tsunami to watch. While Nigeria prepare themselves for an African party, there's still much work to do. They've enjoyed mixed fortunes over the previous four years, and this is a new Nigerian team. While they've looked dangerous going forward, their defence have been leaking goals as a worrying race. In the beginning, we were struggling and struggling. At the moment, we are so happy, you know, to get through. I think with the new players, you know, bringing new players into the team and uh, we're getting to understand each other. They made heavy work of qualifying too, leaving it to their final match against Kenya to ensure their passage to South Africa. Nigeria needed a win while relying on Tunisia to lose in Mozambique and a late winner saw the Super Eagles through in dramatic fashion. It was really, really dramatic because we, we had not, no, we had less chance of going because we depended on um, um, Tunisia losing their game and we have to win against uh, uh, Kenya. We just want to win the game and uh, hopefully Tunisia will get a draw or they'll get, they'll get beaten over there. But at the end of the game, and uh, we, we had the result and uh, everyone in the pitch we said it, it's like celebrating already. With that victory, Nigeria were able to leapfrog Tunisia and claim their qualification group's top spot. South Africa 2010 was a party they had no intention of missing. We have quality uh, good players in the team. We have also young lads coming through. Um, I think we, you know, we will we'll do well really in the World Cup. Nigeria have always produced talented players. In Everton striker Yakubu, they have a real star, a man with leadership skills on and off the pitch. And Nigeria will hope his eye for goal will steer them towards glory in the summer. So he got so much energy and I mean he's, he's a strong, strong player, very strong and very, you know, quick and he's, he's a goal scorer as well. So he, he has played a good impact in the team. I believe in uh, myself, I know I can score wherever and uh, if I have the chance and uh, hopefully our score goes. But it's that opening game against Maradona's Argentina that will set the tone for Nigeria's tournament. A defeat will leave the Super Eagles with much to do.
to facing Argentina in Johannesburg, Nigeria go to Bloemfontein to face Greece, before heading to Durban to take on South Korea. And on their home continent, with their passionate fans in full voice, the Super Eagles aim to ruffle some feathers. Their players remain confident that they can become the first African nation to lift the World Cup. To be honest, my own personal opinion, I would like Nigeria to win the World Cup. And I believe and I hope it's possible. Johannesburg's second stadium is Ellis Park. And as well as being the venue for the Argentina-Nigeria showdown on June the 12th, it will also host group games including the likes of Brazil, Spain and reigning champions Italy. Johannesburg flourished after gold was discovered here in 1886. At one point, three quarters of the city's population worked in the mines. Today, the city of gold is home to over three million people, all of whom are looking forward to welcoming the world. It's the biggest event, so we are very excited, happy about the World Cup. It's a very great thing to us, and we thank God for that because we are waiting for everything that to, to happen. Because on 1996, we lost it with a one vote, so we get it on 2010. Quite a great feeling, really, and uh, of, of course, it's obvious that it's going to open up quite a number of opportunities for us. And the fact that we're going to be um, socializing and mixing with uh, people from various countries and stuff like that, it's, it's quite exciting, really. We can't wait for people to come to Jowick and experience this wonderful, magnific magnificent uh, occasion. The football-mad people of Soweto are counting the days until the World Cup gets underway. The city's history has been blighted with problems, and the World Cup is being seen as a chance to show the world a very different South Africa. Vilakazi Street in Johannesburg is home to not one but two Nobel Peace Prize winners. Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Ellis Park hosted the 2009 Confederations Cup final between the USA and Brazil, but its most famous day was in 1995, when Francois Pinar lifted the Rugby World Cup as South African captain. It is, um, I can't express myself, um, I am 49 years old and I've never seen a World Cup live and it will be for the first time that I'll be watching a, a live World Cup and I'm, I'm excited. As anticipation for the world's biggest competition intensifies, Johannesburg is preparing for its biggest party yet. South Africa is expecting more than 400,000 travelling football fans during the World Cup month for what it hopes to be the best World Cup ever. Since stunning the football world by winning Euro 2004, Greece have laboured on the international stage. Failure to qualify for the World Cup in Germany was followed by humiliation in Austria at their defence of the European Championship. Greece suffered three straight defeats and an early exit. Many believe time has stood still. And they wonder if the national team has failed to move on. Preparing for only their second World Cup, the coach behind their greatest success is desperate to make an impact. I've always told my players that you're playing for yourselves, for your own pride, but you also have to play for Greece. And when you've been European champions, as we have been, then you have to prove you can consistently reach the levels of the great teams. The success of six years ago raised expectations. Once qualification was enough for Greece, now they want more. 
I think all Greek supporters are very grateful to Otto Rehagel for what he's done uh, for the national side and for the country in a way. Uh, they uh, absolutely admire him for his past performance, but I think there is a growing skepticism about the way he manages the team. Euro 2008 was a, a flop, obviously, uh, three defeats in three games. Uh, but uh, it's not just that, it's not just results. Uh, it's some of his decisions and some of his choices um, that are questionable uh, in the eyes of many supporters. We don't play football for the journalists, but we play football for the fans because they're the ones who pay. And I'm only interested in what those close to me have to say on a sporting level, and in my players too. Everything else is something I can't influence, and I don't speak Greek, but that's a big advantage. Despite winning their first three matches without conceding, Greece stumbled and Switzerland capitalised. They eventually finished second in their group, forcing Ray Hagel's men into a playoff against Ukraine. It was not going to be easy. The first leg in Athens ended nil-nil, which meant they travelled to Donetsk, needing to improve. But Otto Ray Hagel's sides have never lacked belief. No, the Obviously, negative thoughts will often go through your mind. When you give a performance like that in your country, and then the game ends as a nil-nil draw, you can't really expect anything better from that point on. But I think we're used to that. We're used to those problems. And when you are used to it, you then have the patience and the right mentality. And then, well, anything's possible. Yamalenko now. Milievsky alongside. Shevchenko didn't connect. Really positive opening this by Ukraine. Kobe. Shevchenko wants it back. Been palmed away by Zoratis. A couple of opportunities here for Aliyev. First one didn't test Zoravis, but that one did. Mistakes. Samaras holding off Timoshuk. Oh, that's a lovely ball by Samaras. And here's Salpingidis. And Greece have taken the lead. Superb counter attack by Greece. And how significant could that away goal prove? Aliyev is expecting a bit more movement. Kyriakos locking arms almost with Milievsky. In by Aliyev. Oh, the delivery is brilliant. And Shevchenko and the youngster Kacharidi got in each other's way then. It's a fabulous free kick from Alia. Fourth and final minute of second half stoppage time. No way through for Milievsky. Might come back out here to Shevchenko. And that perhaps just underlines that it's not going to be Ukraine's night. <laughs> I really can't explain how it feels, but we're so, so pleased to make the finals for the second time in Greece's history. But that's why all the lads will have to be in good shape and in peak condition when the World Cup comes along. It's great, though. You could write a story about it, make a name for yourself playing in a World Cup, and I think that says it all. We're all just so happy. Greece's defensive approach failed at Euro 2008, but Ray Hagel, who will be 71 when the tournament gets underway, relied on defensive tactics once again to progress to South Africa. This is a team that often lacks adventure, but nobody found the net more in European qualification than Theophanis Gekas of Hertha Berlin, who scored 10 goals. I'd like to see him play well in South Africa, because I think he can do so well. He's a very quick player, a good player, and I believe he'll show that in the summer. 
I think the most important players are uh, Karagounis and Katsouranis in the midfield uh, because they are very experienced and they have that football personality that can change things on the pitch when things go wrong. They also have a very strong motive despite the fact that they've won practically everything they could have wished for in their careers and they've played abroad with success like in clubs like uh, Inter and uh, Benfica. Despite that uh, I think they have a very strong incentive to lead the team and in defence Kyriakos, the Liverpool central defender, I think will be the key player, the key ingredient in, in the Greek defence. Greece's World Cup gets underway in Port Elizabeth against South Korea on June the 12th, before they take on Nigeria in Bloemfontein and Argentina in Polokwane. We can either achieve a lot or nothing at all. We're going there with the intention of having a good time, but we don't have any major expectations. As I said before, although we're limited in some ways compared to other teams, our hopes are to play as a unit, together as a team. And I think if we do that, we can achieve a lot. For the first 12 World Cups, South Korea made just one appearance. Then they made up for it qualifying for seven successive tournaments, including South Africa 2010. The only Asian team to go through qualifying unbeaten, they will travel to South Africa, strongly backed by their fanatical fans. There are several survivors from the famous 2002 side that reached the semi-finals of the World Cup they jointly hosted. Hopes are high that they can match that performance. I don't know why people have such high expectations for us, but I'm really glad to hear that they have. As a team, we don't expect to win the tournament, but you never know what will happen. Our team will play with courage and we'll do our best during the tournament. Dominant in Asia, South Korea have struggled on their travels, despite a squad containing several European-based players, chief among them Park Ji-sung, the first Asian winner of the Champions League with Manchester United. Hoping to cure their travel sickness, the Federation took a squad of 24 Asian-based players to South Africa, hoping they could get used to the conditions. They included No Byung Jun. When we play at home, we are used to the climate and the atmosphere. I think when we go to South Africa, it'll be hard for us to adapt to the different conditions. We'll need to train harder to get used to it. It's so different from what we're used to. I think the experience will be very difficult for us. 14 matches unbeaten appeared a faultless qualification campaign. That success was based on a solid defence that proved far too strong for their opponents, conceding just seven goals. Finding the back of the net, though, proved a different story. The team managed just 22 goals, an average of under two a game. So everything considered, was qualification more problematic than it appeared to be? Nothing was easy during qualifying. And I do remember how hard it was. Going with the national team abroad to play was very hard. The games against Iran and Saudi Arabia, they were both good teams with good players. And it was very hard. Those were definitely the hardest games. Few qualifying games created as much tension as those between North and South Korea, technically still in conflict, 50 years after the end of the Korean War. The North's refusal to play the South Korean anthem or fly their flag meant the 1-1 draw between the two rivals was played out in Shanghai, China, not Pyongyang. The hardest time for us was when our national team drew the game with North Korea. It was our first game, and it wasn't the start we planned. It was the most difficult time for us all. Their form in qualifying was excellent. The South Koreans topped their group without losing a single game. But the squad know they cannot be carried away with that success. The tougher opponents lie ahead in South Africa. South Korea's opening game against Greece will be played at the new Nelson Mandela Bay Stadium in Port Elizabeth. Trips to Johannesburg and Durban follow, but the players are aware of the significance of that first match in Port Elizabeth.
It'll be great if we can win our first game. If you do well in your opening match, you gain confidence, both as a player and as a team. Your attitude towards the whole tournament changes. So if we can win our first match against Greece, there'll be a great chance for us to make it through to the last 16. South Korea sealed their qualification with a 2-0 win against the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi. This time they were grateful to be away from home and the pressures of their support. But the World Cup will be a different prospect altogether. And while no one expects them to bring home the top prize, South Korea no longer fear the biggest challenges. <laughs> The fact that the game wasn't held in Korea, it did give us an advantage in a way. But now, the situation will be different. Now, we're playing all our games away from home. And while we're not aiming to win the World Cup, we are aiming to get at least to the last 16 or the quarter-finals. But if we do make the last 16, we'd be very happy. Greece are South Korea's first opponents in South Africa. Soccer City beckons for a date with Argentina, and then comes a meeting with Nigeria in Durban. The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular. But in June 2010, they will become even more so. 32 teams will set out in pursuit of the dream to become world champions. Make sure you don't miss football's greatest show on earth, World Cup 2010.